So, you know, I was just wondering if anybody wanted a free mixtape. Anybody? Ten dollars? Damn, we got a couple of things to take a look at here. Might as well start right here. You were hospitalized in Dekelia, a British sovereign base area on Cyprus. It's part of British overseas territory that falls outside of Cypriot jurisdiction. You got moved from Cuba's little America right into Cyprus's little Britain. Why Dekelia? The UK and the US remain close allies. The last place Cypher would think to look for you is inside their own system. That's what kept you safe in British military hospital for nine years. The safest place from a whale is inside its own belly. You were a regular Geppetto. Well, it wasn't Pinocchio who led me out to safety. So who was that guy? Cypher went so far as to attack British territory, burning their own ally. That's how badly they wanted you dead. Wow. He said I was in a British military hospital. But the doctor had a Greek accent. They hire locally. Easier to trust them. De Kelly is also home to Greek Cypriots, after all. What about the Turks? They haven't returned to the south. Not yet. The Cyprus dispute is still a long way from resolved. The country is just as split as it was in 74. Turkish Cypriots in the north, Greek Cypriots in the south. Between them, the Green Line, the UN established. And Decalia sits right on top of it. It does. Part of the buffer zone between the two groups. Another reason it was the perfect place to hide you. Easy to spot any outsiders snooping around. So how do things stand? Now, last year, the Turks declared that the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus is an independent state. Though it's only Turkey that recognizes it. In the past, the Greeks and Turks lived side by side in the same villages. There are reasons to fight. Those came from the outside. Greece, Turkey, Britain, America, they all had their own stake in pitting the two sides against each other. But once you spark something like this, it's impossible to control. Both sides build up grudges like debt, without the foresight to see that each act of revenge just fans the flames, and then it's too late for other nations to rush in with peace talks. The embers keep on smoldering. Each nation's arrogance only breeds anarchy. The world is paralyzed by this hunger for revenge. Cyprus is no different. I like that play on world politics. People are kind of just stupid like that, you know what I'm saying? You're up. We're changing ships. Well, we can't go sailing the Suez in a whaler. The Suez Canal. When did they reopen it? Not long after you were attacked. Once they finish sweeping it for mines after the Arab-Israeli conflict. Can you stand? We're gonna transfer to a container ship for passage through the Suez. Our destination is Pakistan, Afghanistan's neighbor to the south. There we disembark and head via Peshawar to the Zero Line, the border. We'll travel to the Khyber Pass by road. And then? We continue on horseback. Afghanistan's main roads are under Soviet control. We'll need to go around them. It'll be all narrow, winding paths through the mountains. We'll do better on horseback. It's a local guerrilla tactic. They use the high ridges to avoid air recons. Then they charge down the mountains for ambushes. The Soviets still haven't devised a counter strategy. Our time frame is only half as much as we really need. It's gonna be a tough march. Better horses than boats. Well, it'll make for good physiotherapy. Take the time to get used to that new arm. While the Soviets have indicated they are not participating in the Los Angeles Olympics, primarily because the United States has made no attempt to guarantee the safety of the Soviet Union's athletes, the United States is increasingly demonstrating the belief that the issue has nothing to do with its preparations, and in fact this is retaliation for the Western nation's boycott of the previous Moscow Olympics. That concludes today's news. That's what... That's quite some news. The uh, Soviet Union not attending the LA Olympics? Yeah. Andropov's death has changed some things. They're calling it revenge for the Western boycott of the Moscow Olympics. Countries boycotted the Moscow Olympics? Yes. In protest of the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan, over 50 countries were absent. It's too bad I didn't get to see Yamashita's judo. 
When the 40th Army crossed the Amu River four years ago, detente went right out the window. The U.S. Congress chose not to ratify SALT II, and Reagan's hardline politics won him the presidency in a landslide. According to him, the Soviet Union's an evil empire. <laughs> the Second Cold War. And there's been no end to regional conflicts and civil wars. Lebanon, the Falklands, Grenada, Iran, Iraq. The story never changes. Egypt and Israel did sign a peace treaty. But then the driving force on the Egyptian side, President Sadat, was assassinated afterward. Apparently, his actions were considered a betrayal of his fellow Arabs. Islamic extremists? Yes. Fundamentalist extremists have been responsible for some bold acts of terrorism in recent years. We've had extremist students in Iran take U.S. Embassy workers hostage in suicide bombings in Lebanon. Over 300 foreign soldiers stationed there have been killed. The countries have yet to develop an effective means of dealing with terrorism. Afraid of losing their own men, they've pulled their forces out, handing private forces a golden opportunity. Private forces? Small armies with no national affiliation, working for the highest bidder. That's right, they got the idea from you. After Mother Base went down, they began spreading to meet the soaring demand. Miller's organization is just one of many PFs now. The entire world is after you. But at the same time, it needs you too. Mm. Miller told me about what happened in the Caribbean nine years ago. You... Wow, that's... that's... I think that's really funny. <laughs> Basically, they're just like, hey, Snake. You sort of started mercenary groups, and now everybody's taking it from you, and, uh, you're kind of, yeah, we, they, everybody needs you, but at the same time, they also want you dead, so that they can just, like, do everything instead of you. It's like a bad business transaction, or a business transaction that went awesome. bad. I hear they started calling you Shalashaska in Afghanistan. What's that about? <laughs> You know the term, Sharashka? It's slang for a suspicious, hastily thrown together organization. The word became associated with a type of forced labor facility in the Soviet Gulag system. OKB scientists and engineers who'd been convicted of crimes were sent to a Sharashka for forced R&D. The Sharashkas were supervised by Lavrenti Berea of the NKVD, the secret police, under the official name, Fourth Special Department. Forced research? That's not very different from what we do here. <laughs> Diamond Dogs is different. Everyone here believes in you. Regardless of where they came from or why they're here, they revere you. And they're fighting because it was their choice. And if it wasn't, they'd leave? Who knows? That's our reality here, whether it's real or not. If there's another truth, I don't want to know it. All that matters is that's the concept that's taken shape in their heads. The traces of a group ideology, our superstructure, to put it in Marxist terms. All right. Go on. All right. So anyway, at some point the enemy started calling me Sharashka. This was after the war in Afghanistan broke out. While I was keeping an eye on you in that hospital, I was also heading up interrogations here. The men I broke gave up their comrades and families everything they wanted to protect the most. No real cause for it. I just let myself get caught up in the old Russian pride. And suddenly I received the honor of becoming special interrogation advisor to the forced labor camps. But the more men I interrogated, the more people saw me as just that. The interrogator. It helped cover my real objective of keeping you safe. You went that far for me. Far enough to keep you alive. I ended up being pretty well known among the Afghan guerrillas. Some of them would have seen me on the battlefield. And that's how I got the second half of the name. Shashka. It's a sword. A type of saber from the Caucasus. Russian dragoons and Cossacks carry them into battle. Now the Russian Empire had a general by the name of Fyodor Arturovich Keller. His bravery earned him the nickname Russia's Greatest Shashka. Someone must have known about that. Because somewhere along the line, Shashka got stuck on the end of Sharashka. The guerrillas were using the name amongst themselves. And by the time I got to hearing about it, pronunciation had wound up as Shalashashka. So, half gulag, half hero sword is a perfect fit. 
But you see how rumors and ideas about people can get out of hand fast. Once you create a character and put it out there in public mind, it warps and twists with every baseless rumor. And before you know it, all people see are phantoms. In my case, it works out just fine. I'm plenty used to working under aliases. Our entire base is underground, hence phantom pain. So, I guess the name is sort of, you know, um, uh, Snake's Phantom Pain, as well as Causes, and, you know, the Phantom of Paz, and also the Phantom of Diamond Dogs, you know? Hmm. They mentioned something about Salt 2. I don't remember that being an actual law. I've never learned about it in class, so I believe this is a made-up law that we need to know about in order to understand the universe of Metal Gear Solid. So Salt 2 still hasn't gone into effect. That treaty was drawn up to limit not just the size of the U.S. and Soviet Union's nuclear arsenals, but also their delivery systems. The whole deal. That's when we thought all those years of negotiations had paid off, somebody decides to invade Afghanistan. The timing couldn't have been worse. The president was in the middle of the Salt 2 talks back then. You mean while you were busy trying to stop Peace Walker? I heard. President Ford was meeting with the General Secretary in Vladivostok. In his absence, the political brass in America detected what they didn't realize was false nuclear launch data from Peace Walker, and were on the verge of ordering a retaliatory nuclear strike. Coleman's big idea? Humans are incapable of destroying themselves. Turns out he never knew what humans are capable of. If that AI, I mean, the boss, hadn't found a way to stop the fake data transmission, they probably would have gone ahead with the launch. Deterrence was revealed as the pipe dream it was. All thanks to you, and her. The U.S.-Soviet talks looked set to fall through. What happened in Nicaragua no doubt helped trigger a change of heart. But in the end, the times define the politics. When you grab their tail, they turn and bite your hand. Mm. I first met you 20 years ago now. The place was Selenuyarsk in the Soviet Union. We were enemies. So basically the SALT Act is uh, like a treaty in between people, but it sort of failed, and uh, people got salty. Yeah. I was with the GRU, you were still fighting for America. 1964, Operation Snake Eater. Its objective, the assassination of the legendary soldier known as the Boss. And um, I ate lots of snakes in that game. A lot. They were delicious. Until they spoiled, and then I ate them anyways, and... Probably vomited all over the ground afterwards, whenever I got back to civilization and realized what good food was, but, I mean... You know... Man. When you returned home successful, they awarded you the title Big Boss. Your CO, Zero, sought to carry on the boss's will by covertly establishing his own organization. You knew the original members from Operation Snake Eater. From America, there was David O, or as he was to you, Major Zero. Donald Anderson, a.k.a. Sigand. Dr. Clark, who went by a paramedic during the operation. And the fourth, you. From China, there was Eva. And me, Ocelot, from the Soviet Union. Six in total. Wait. So Ocelot's from the Soviet Union, and he dresses like a Western, like, cowboy. And he talks like one, too. What the fuck? And he wields a shotgun. I I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Us, government notions of friend and foe were meaningless. As were East and West, we joined forces by our will alone. Our objective was to fulfill the boss's dying wish. To make the world one. And to do it, Zero used the Philosopher's Legacy. The secret war fund you obtained during Operation Snake Eater. This organization would go on to become... Cypher. I, on the other hand, was left with the problem. You only recovered half of the legacy. I had to locate the other half myself. When I found the funds, I passed them on to Zero, just as you wanted. I still trusted him in those days. 
We thought what he was doing was the boss's will. Until he started that one project. Les enfants terribles. Zero called in. You parted ways. As did Eva, leaving only Anderson and Clark still with him. I maintain limited contact. Although, truth be told, we were just keeping tabs on one another. The reason was always you. After you returned to the Army and created Foxhound, you left America. For a time, even I'd lost track of you. I'd imagine Zero did, too. You always were the best when it came to hide-and-seek. Mm. Zero created Cypher, an information that... I first met... Zero cre... So basically, Zero was that super ugly dude that we saw in the very beginning. In, like, the trench coat, and he was, like, burned face and stuff like that. Yeah, that's the guy that I'm going to headshot at the very end. Yeah. I like that idea. Created Cypher, an information network to tap into every corner of the globe. Woven together, Cypher's arteries make the world just one big organism. And that's not all. It also monitors the thorn in Zero's side. That's you, tracking your coordinates wherever you might go. The further you strayed from your roots, the larger Zero became. It's as if he was trying to close the gap between you. But before long, he disappeared from public life. Only a few people had direct contact with him. For a time, I was one of them. Then a year after you fell into your coma, he slipped out of sight entirely. Since then, nothing. No photos, no recordings, not even a reliable rumor as to his whereabouts. I tried every method I could think of, but Zero was gone. Freed of his control, his creation, his power continued to grow. Cypher is a great beast, and Zero was its spine. But even without him, it's endured, evolved. But now its body is rotting, riddled with parasites. Parasites like the ones who attacked you nine years ago in the Caribbean, and then at the hospital. Cypher's Black Ops Unit, XOF. They learned where you were, and came to wipe the slate clean. Wow, so basically that entire thing in the hospital was just a, a sect of Cypher, the people who were trying to kill me. A sect of them. Trying to kill me for revenge, not even for any distinct reason because their boss said so or whatever. Wow. Some of these guys are just freaking bastards, man. Alright, final two, and then uh, we can get on with the rest of the video. I think I'm going to make this an entirely separate video of just recordings, I guess, catching up and everything as we uh, go through everything. So, uh, let's listen in. Christmas Eve, 1979. The Soviet Union rolled into Afghanistan. Muslims had revolted against the Soviet-friendly regime established the year before. The DRA forces could no longer contain it themselves, so the Soviets went in to intervene. The Afghan government was powerless and fraught with infighting. They lost the hearts and minds of the people, and that alarmed the Soviet leadership. With the Islamic Revolution happening in Iran, the Soviets felt they had to act fast or risk the spread of Islamic revivalism. A superpower sending a motorized rifle division against men on horseback with antique rifles. Everyone thought it'd be over in an instant. Um, all of this history is sort of true, but sort of not true. Um, the riflery and stuff like that at this time, that is true. Literally Afghanistan and, um, like, all other countries really besides the U.S. And, um, well, I mean, the U.S., of course, Europe, um, I believe that China was, like, coming up as a power, not really as a power, but you know, as China, what they do. China isn't even really a power, they're, uh, they're like a skin tag, I guess, to the US, I don't, I don't know. More than a skin tag, they're like a tumor. No, but like on the outside of the body, I don't know, fucking. They're like an 184 pound scrotum. There's actually a dude out there with a 180 pound scrotum. 
that you had to have like surgically removed. They're like that. If you guys don't know what a scrotum is, look it up. I'm um, no, just no. Only it wasn't. Some Muslims made their fight a jihad, a holy war, and began a guerrilla campaign on all fronts. A war of attrition. These fighters call themselves Mujahideen. They're being supported by the West through Pakistan. That's why Miller was involved. He was training them near the Zero Line, sponsored by the CIA. The war has become a nightmare for the Soviet troops stationed here. They thought they'd be headed home in six months at the most. Then a year passed. Two years. Now here we are four years on with no exit in sight. This is kind of a reflection of modern day Afghan war. We sort of got over there and, the, you know, of course, terrorist sects are very hard to eliminate because they have many leaders like, oh, yo, we killed Osama Bin Laden, well, we pull out. No, can't freaking pull out. There's still more bitches. To, uh, I'm sorry. Hold up. Hold up. You can't pull out because there are many more heads left to cut off. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a freaking terrorist cell. They have like 30 leaders with the exact same power in line of succession. Like one gets chopped off, there's another one left. Sort of like a Hydra, except the heads don't grow back because people don't grow back. They die. Afghanistan has become the Soviet Union's Vietnam. Yeah. The Soviet troops on the ground want to go home, but at least they have homes to go back to. The Afghans have lost theirs. The Soviets destroy the Kishloks, villages, wherever they can. They burn down homes and fields, fill in wells, turn pastures into minefields. It's created a mass of refugees who fled to Pakistan. If the Mujahideen are fish swimming around the villages, the Soviets will go so far as to dry out their ocean. But this has had a big price. There's bitter resentment among the Afghans, and they're taking out their anger on the soldiers on the front lines. Among the Mujahideen are the Pashtun people. They're fiercely devoted to their code of Badal, or revenge. Soviets they've captured have had their hands, feet, and noses cut off before being left to die at the side of the road, just to show their comrades what they're capable of. Friendlies who come across them can do nothing but put them out of their misery. Then they burn down another village in retaliation. And the cycle of vengeance goes on. Basically, this is a very accurate <laughs> representation of world war. Warfare. Modern warfare. Um, you know. You go into a place in order to get something. And uh, the people there sort of are okay with it at first, and then you're just like, hey, I need something that you're not willing to give me. And they're like, hey, uh, suck my cock. And then they're like, hey, my cock's bigger than yours, so suck mine. And then it's just a never-ending cycle of shit. Pure shit. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed. As always, I love you all. Peace. Yeah.